Colin Jackson. Colin Jackson is a very well-known um, persona in the internet community in New Zealand. He has in the past been in the council in Internet New Zealand. He is also a technical com um, technology commentator for Radio New Zealand um, for one of the shows, and he currently, you know, writes a blog. And he has worked in the governments before, so he does know, you know, some of. Um, some of what goes on behind the political scenes sometimes, sometimes, um, or he tries to know. They do say, don't they, that um, law and sausage are the same and you should never watch either being made. <laughs> I find myself in the unfortunate position of following Glenn Moody, but uh, never mind, we'll give it a go. First step is a fail on the remote. Bit of a fanciful title here, but my real point here is that free software is subject to legal threats. There's quite a range of them, quite a, a range of ways in which the law is changing and has the potential to damage or even suppress free software. One of the obvious ones that gets talked about a lot is copyright expansion. Um, there's been a, an enormous expansion of what can be copyrighted, which I mean, is originally intended for literary works with the Statute of Anne. Now sound, movies, software, sheet music, pretty much anything you can think of can be copyrighted and is being copyrighted, um, and that appears to have gone way beyond what the original framers of copyright intended. There's also the endless extension of copyright. People probably know Steamboat Willie up behind me. It's um, Mickey Mouse's first outing in 1928. Now, Mickey Mouse has been close to coming out of copyright, entering the public domain, that is, in the US on four separate occasions. Every time, Congress has been persuaded to enact a piece of legislation extending copyright terms. Most recently, that was in 1998, when the so-called Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, which took it out to 2023, they got Sonny Bono, who even then was pretty much a has-been, to go and play music at Congress and weep at them and say his grandkids wouldn't have a free meal ticket for the rest of life unless... Uh, they extended Walt Disney's copyright even further. So there's no real, um, with endless extensions like this, copyright becomes pretty much infinite. There's no, there's no effective end to it. Software patents, again, these are another thing which have potential to do huge harm to free software. There's quite a number of uh, respects in which they have uh, harmful effects. For instance, it is very difficult to tell whether some technique that you might be about to use in your piece of software has been patented by somebody. That is an expensive process to find that out. Of course, uh, free software being free means that we don't really have the resources to go through expensive legal processes to discover if somebody's already patented things. It leads to uh, deadweight costs in lawyers' fees. And I apologize to those of you in the room who may be lawyers, but um, to be honest, uh, we don't actually need to pay lawyers' fees if we really don't need to. It just adds cost. And you get a lot of unintended bad consequences. In what some might regard as a certain amount of a schadenfreude, or the pleasure in others' misfortune, uh, many of you will remember recently that um, a certain large company persuaded the um, International Standards Organization to adopt its own word processing standard as another document standard. I'm talking about something called 00XML. At the time, they assured all and sundry that the thing was completely unencumbered by IP claims. It has now become clear that that is not the case. And that um, 
aspects of WXML were patented by a company who was suing Microsoft about it even back then. Nice one, guys. And, of course, there's the dreaded actor, which I will talk a bit more about in due course. But before we get to actor, we've got toll booths on the, uh, toll booths on the information highway. Toll booths, as you no doubt know, are a way of making money out of a piece of road or a piece of way in and out of something or other. Wellington used to fund itself by putting a toll booth, um, I think, somewhere around the bottom of the Nio Gorge and charging people to go in and out of the city. I'm sure they're not the only ones who ever have done that. And um, the analogy with the Internet is pretty clear here. The Internet works by essentially free exchange of traffic. It, the Internet is a co-op. It's not formally owned. Often at gatherings like this, I like to ask people if anybody thinks the Internet would have been successful if it was owned by, say, IBM, not, not particularly making an example of them, but any large company who might have built some network. And in fact, several large companies did build large public networks in the uh, 1980s or so. People might remember Prodigy and CompuServe. Uh, there were others. Um, some of them were moderately successful. None of them experienced, of course, the stunning success of the Internet, which essentially ate all of them, and that is because the Internet is a co-op. Nobody's out there trying to clip the ticket on everything, which was definitely the case for Prodigy and CompuServe. So the Internet is an open network. It is the so-called dumb network. It just moves information around the world. It doesn't care what is on that information what is in that information. It is not trying to click the ticket. If you're doing your online banking or booking your airfares, nobody on the internet is out there trying to shave a few cents or a few bucks off that transaction. Any Zealand or whoever can go out and build something to sell you things across the internet and you can take advantage of that without somebody in the middle trying to decide what all those bits mean between you and Any Zealand and trying to take advantage of that. And that's what I mean by the toll booths. Just imagine that we didn't have the notion, that so-called notion of net neutrality. That might be the rate card from your local telco. You get my point, right? If we allow people to start differentially passing those bits and charging you different amounts for them, then this is the kind of situation you can get to. And it's no mistake. I mean, tel telcos are hurting from the internet. The internet is hollowing out a lot of their former business model. And so they really would prefer it was something they could control a bit better. So would, of course, various other industries who are threatened by the internet. And there are various ways they try to achieve affecting the way people see these things. They so-called framing the debate. I don't know who's read that book. It's actually quite interesting. The thesis of the author is that we mentally categorize things together and it's our language that, that, that helps us do that. It's also related to something called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis that people maybe, maybe uh, remember, which effectively says that um, your, uh, the way you think is driven by the language available to you. That's how framing works. You can use words to really drive how people think about things. And we see examples of that happening all the time. Anybody like to give me a one-word description of this guy? <laughs> exactly. He's a pirate. Now, I think we'd all be... Um, I'd be pretty concerned to meet him, frankly. Uh, I would have no, uh, no um, reassurance about my personal safety. And that is a pirate. A pirate is somebody who commits acts of murder and robbery on the high seas. A pirate isn't necessarily somebody who goes around infringing copyright. But we all seem to swallow that term. The media swallows that term. The term is used very, very widely. This guy is being used as some kind of model for copyright infringement. People who infringe copyrights are being compared with this guy. And we're letting them get away with it. Another favorite term, what the heck does that mean? You've got a lot of things wrapped up in there. The notion, first of all, that you have property rights in the first place, in ideas, 
in soft things that can be somehow monopolized by, uh, by, by legal fiat from the state. But you also have quite a variety of different things that intellectual property supposedly refers to. And we know that. We've got copyright, you've got patents, you've got trademarks, you've rights in plant species. So there's, there's a whole load of things that are, held, that are described by this term intellectual property. And this is another one that we just keep letting media, government, and the legal profession get away with. It's a framing the debate item, intellectual property. And we really have to push back whenever we hear this because the term is essentially meaningless and it also overreaches what the law provides. The law does not provide property in things. It provides, under certain circumstances, a limited monopoly to certain people to exploit certain ideas. But it's not actually clear what the law should say about so-called intellectual property. It's pretty clear what the law should say about ownership of physical goods. This computer, say. This ch these chairs, this building. We could probably all have a pretty fair stab about writing down how the law of a country should be written regards physical property. You know, I built it, it's mine, I sell it to you, it's yours. We could, we could all have a pretty, pretty clear, write a pretty clear spec for that law. It is completely debatable what the law should say about copyright, about patents, about trademarks, about all those things. And that gets debated endlessly, it gets consulted on, and in many cases it gets extended to, uh, in favour of the, um, the so-called rights holders, the people who, who, who consider they own this intellectual property. Because it is not, there's no natural place in which the law should be written. There's no natural spec for IP law. So what happens, as I say, you keep getting endless extensions because it's always, you're always just arguing in a grey area. Now, we all know that software is built on what went before. In fact, pretty much the whole of human culture and technology is built on what went before. We'll fire everybody. I mean, it, this is really, really clear. Newton, for instance, his famous quote, um, if I've seen further than other managers because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. And Newton was one of the most litigious so-and-sos out there. I mean, he, he, he fought Leibniz over who invented calculus for decades but he still acknowledged the enormous debt that he owed to all the scientists who'd gone before him. He was also staggeringly clever and uh, did, did have some quite remarkable original insights. That is the result of some of the Highland clearances in Scotland in the 1700s. That's the remains of a village. I'm afraid I don't have, the, have its name there. Um, during that period, uh, Scotland defend, essentially was, uh, got a reasonably raw deal from um, an act of union with England. Um, I know I'm not going to go down the whole Braveheart thing, and I don't have any Scottish ancestry, but the effect was that a lot of basically English landowners moved in and kicked people off land that they thought was a commons and had lived in for centuries and ran as small holdings. Now, the English landowners got a lot more productivity out of that land, actually, but that doesn't necessarily excuse what they did to get there, in my book. The analogy, again, is pretty clear. We have the endless expansion of um, things like copyright have the, exactly this effect. They can move on and monopolize things that we all regard as commons, ideas, ways of doing stuff, algorithms do need to demand transparency about this kind of thing. I'm going to keep moving. People know where this is, I'm sure. You probably know the story of this place. You've got a, a small Pacific island. It's really small. It doesn't have much in the way of, um, of local DNA. There's only a few plants that grow there. There's not much. It's pretty hard to make a living. It does have some native forest of a few species. And, of course, it has this magnificent volcanic rock that you can carve into these amazing moai. Now, there were various, um, what we would call iwi, living on this, um, on this island, and they all sought mana 
as is common in Polynesian cultures, and the way they achieved mana was by creating these giant moai. Now, you can create the moai out of rock, which they had a nearly endless supply, but you also need trees because they have to be stood up at the coast. So you have to cut down the trees to roll these things along on. And that's what happened. There we are, there's a quarry where they're making them. So they, they, they carve these things, they, they roll them along, they stand them up, and then they get a bit more mana, and of course, the next year we have to go along and do a bigger one, or a whole row of them, or something like this. They knew they were cutting down the trees on the island. They knew they were cutting down the last trees on the island. Now, they need these trees because they're the only way they can build canoes and go fishing. Without it, there is really very, very little to eat over there. Incidentally, the island has been um, re-vegetated uh, with European flora since. So, I mean, you've got actual grass here. You wouldn't have had that then. So anyway, they knew they were cutting it down. But my point is, the guy who cut the last tree down, it was still the logical thing for him to do. It was entirely the right thing, according to a limited frame, for him to go and chop that tree down. Because if he didn't, the next guy would. This is actually an, an absolutely picture-perfect illustration of the, uh, the economist's little puzzle called the tragedy of the commons, where you, you completely destroy some common resource. Obviously, I'm making an analogy again with the, free software, with the free software movement and with algorithms and things that are in the public domain and which are getting enclosed and taken away. And that brings us to the law and its complete, um, complete the way in which the law defines this whole area. And what should the law say? Some people say the law is one of these. You... Uh, you might like to guess what I got on Google Images when I searched for ass. I tell you, it wasn't one of those. Uh, no. Uh, well, not, not the front end, anyway. Uh, but actually, I think the law is more of an OS, an operating system. Because the law sets the frame it sets the framework in which everything we use operates. The law is the matrix, in a way, although I'm mixing my metaphors there because that one's from Tron. The law defines what we all do or how we all operate. And it particularly defines it when you're talking about soft stuff like copyright, trademarks, and free software. Because, as I said, the law about these things, it is not clear, it is not naturally clear to most people what it should say, and it's open to debate and all those things. So, just like this, this woman here, we're all operating in a, a framework, a set of rules that gets defined and controls pretty much what we can do and is mutable and gets affected by others. Now we should talk a bit about who writes the law. Some people say it's him. It's not actually the architect from the Matrix. Um, although, of course, developers who are writing OSIs might feel that they're the architect from the Matrix, but uh, in democracies, that's not how it works. Incidentally, does anybody else think he looks like Vint? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that almost is true. That is spooky. Anyway. Just thought I'd show you this. As we all know, the biological and social stimulation of the family leads to private reflection outside party needs. loyalties which can only lead to thought crime.
courage, strength, and youth are sacrificed. Sometimes uh, live in fear that um, we're going to uh, forget that film except as inspiration for Apple's 1984 ad, but never mind. Um, that novel and the more modern film of it, which I just showed you a trailer of, have kind of stalked English political system for the last 50 years or so, uh, in that people are really, really concerned about totalitarianism, which, of course, George Orwell spent illustrates so graphically here. He's got all the images. He's got, um, he's got the framing the debate. You notice they're using a kind of corrupted version of English in which you, uh, you can't even express bad thoughts. It's nicely done. Brilliant. That isn't where the law comes from in New Zealand and in fact in many countries, although there is a risk of that and in some places are closer to it than others. Even said do worry sometimes about the total surveillance society. Clip in there. This is a, um, a poster reassuring citizens about the uh, CCTV uh, epidemic in the UK. But democracy really is what stops a nation sliding into totalitarianism. Who knows who she is? Ripped it off a DVD instead. I just want to dissect that in a couple of places. Um, copyright infringement is not piracy. We've talked about that. That's an exercise in framing. But they just asserted that it was. Copyright infringement is not theft. That is literally true. It is not theft. By the way, I'm not saying it's okay to go out and infringe copyright, but I am attacking the points in that particular message. Copyright infringement is not theft. Oops. Copyright infringement is not a crime. It's actually literally true. It is not, despite what they put on that, um, on that DVD, on the thing that they push on all the DVDs they sell in New Zealand. It's not true. It may become one, but it isn't the case. Yes? Yes, you can break the law without it being a crime. It can be an offence. It's a civil offence. A cri there's, a, there's a list of things that are actual crimes, in which case the state will prosecute you for them. There are things which are offences which are much lower level. You're not actually a criminal if you're convicted of one, you're an offender. Um, the state may or may not prosecute you for that, um, or, um, or some person who feels their rights have been infringed 
may take a civil action against you. I got another Is that, is that actually true? If you're convicted of breach of copyright, now it has to be as defined in the Copyright Act. Is that actually true? It carries true? five years jail. I'll have, to, I'll have to bow to you on that one. That was certainly my understanding. And I'll try and... New Zealand? And I'll try and find the thing for you now. If you can, I understood it was a civil offence. I still... Even so, we've still got a situation where we are being lied to. I'm just going to click through these because they're kind of obvious. We know these things and we all know that. And it is a, it's a digression up to this point to the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, or ACTA to its friends, which is an agreement being negotiated in secret by um, negotiators from a variety of countries. Uh, then... A bunch of um, IP lobbyists are heavily involved in this. They get, to, uh, they, get, they get to see this. There is a very tightly held treaty, and we'll talk a bit more about the secrecy in a minute. We don't know too much about what's in it because of that reason. Jamie Love, who's a, um, an NGO guy from the US, I forget the name of his particular outfit, but uh, Center for Democracy and Technology or something like that, he uh, claims to have heard from the U.S. negotiator that the reason it's held in secret is because they don't want the uh, other countries involved to have difficulty getting it through their um, democratic process. That may well be the case. We don't know. It, we know it definitely contains a chapter about Internet. And uh, Michael Geist, who's a uh, prominent IP lawyer, or IP professor, I should say, in Canada, has put up a, um, a site where he discusses what he's been able to find out about it. And most of what I'm putting up here as being believed to be in this treaty are from Michael Geist. He says it contains third-party liability for infringements. That's been around in, I believe, in U.S. law for some time. For instance, Napster got sued on that basis. It contains legal protection for digital rights management, regardless of whether or not the digital rights management is being used to prevent fair use or fair dealing. That apparently is explicit, again, according to Michael Geist. That means that, effectively, that companies can lock down materials so that you cannot exercise what in the US would be fair use rights and in New Zealand would be slightly more limited fair dealing rights and you can't legally, can't break into that. It contains mandatory disconnections for infringement of copyright, apparently, which does appear really to be a hundred-year-old industry getting to strangle the new information infrastructures they're born. But, and it contains mandatory prison for infringements. Now, this is a treaty, I should say. It's not law. It's not even a treaty yet. It's, a, it's something that its negotiators hope will become a treaty. Once it gets negotiated and agreed by the negotiators, it would then have to be passed into the law of the various countries involved, which is most of the ones you want to live in, by the way. Um, it's EU, it's US, it's here, it's Australia, and it's, it's a modest, moderate number of others. But at that stage, once, once, the, once the treaty has been negotiated, like what stage um, the uh, countries are then going to be under a lot of pressure to actually ratify it and implement it. Another thing it contains are border measures. Again, we don't know what they involve. Um, there's a lot of speculation on the Internet that involves um, laptop searches at the border. I, um, I think that uh, to some extent I'm not so concerned about that one because... In fact, the law of almost every country states that they can do what they like to you at the border anyway. It's true. Uh, you have no rights when you're crossing a border, and neither does your laptop. That's what bothers me most about this and what bothers most people about the treaty, the fact that it's being negotiated in secret and we don't know what's in it except for the kind of rumours that we get 
Everybody who's had to, um, who, who gets to see it is made to sign non-disclosure. I understand it's a pretty, heavy, pretty extreme form of non-disclosure. Again, my understanding is that this is being treated by the um, Bush administration, subsequently by the Obama administration, as a national security grade secret. And in this country, you go to jail for leaking one of those. I think secrecy about national security can be justified and is justifiable under some circumstances. I don't have a problem with that. But I think security, sorry, secrecy about something like this is unconscionable. As it denies people their chance to have their say about the whole thing until it's already presented as a fin finished package to prevent those evil pirates. Secrecy also leads to um, governments having to sign things. Now, I'm just going to mention, well, we've got a couple more minutes, mention the Aussie FTA here. I don't want people to think, first of all, that I'm against free trade agreements. I'm not particularly. But the Aussie free trade agreement was a particular case in point. Australia, the Prime Minister at the time, John Howard, said he was going to get an FTA with the Americans. And he did. But he'd been trumpeting that for some time. So they went away to, his officials went away to negotiate it with the American officials. And the Australian officials ended up with something they said, we can't do any better than this, and it's bad for Australia, and we advise you not to sign it. Of course, it was politically impossible for John Howard not to sign that, so he signed it. Now, what happens is Aussie gave away a whole load of IP restrictions, and they didn't get access to the American agricultural markets, which was what was in it for them. Let's hope that doesn't happen here. Finally, I'm just going to leave us with the, uh, the wreckage of Easter Island society. They had, a, uh, they had a complete population crash after they chopped down their last tree. I wonder if that could happen to us, to our free software, if we implement these kind of measures to control the sharing of intellectual property. Happy to take questions. And I'm happy to be proved wrong on chapter and verse on the Copyright Act as well. Hi, um, Brad here. Uh, that was uh, uh, an interesting talk. Thank you. The last little uh, point where you left us, um, the negotiation of bilateral trade agreements, it's actually quite an insidious uh, process that, uh, that happens there because on top of the bilateral negotiations that go on, we have uh, overarching bodies like the WTO, for example, that insist on uh, a, a sort of a, what they define as a level playing field. So if I have certain favorable rules for one country, I have to provide at least the same kind of access uh, to other countries. And uh, I, I live and work in the Pacific Islands, by the way. We're under pressure from Australia and New Zealand to negotiate a region-wide free trade agreement. And we would almost certainly be subject to the provisions in ACTA because, de facto, Australia has already acceded to all of the important conditions in that agreement um, through the, bi the bilateral agreement that they've already signed with, with the U.S. Uh, with the U.S., that's correct. And uh, effectively, that would, uh, that would affect New Zealand and any other nation that was party to the agreement. So this is very much a backdoor process. You know, all they need to do is hit a few key nations, and they've already got them, South Korea, Japan, China, maybe not so much, Western Europe, North America. And uh, once that's done, anybody who wants to play on the international market is effectively forced to abide by those, con by those same conditions because of things like the WTO. Yeah. Um, it's, it means that the only way to redress these issues is to take things right up to the, to the international level and to, in other words, to attack the, these points explicitly rather than trying to stay out of the debate in the first place. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, if you're a, uh, a small guy in a, um, in a negotiating position against a large country, corporate, what have you, you have pretty much zero power. That's always been the case. I mean, if you're dealing with, I'm not going to name any companies that say you've got to deal with a large company, you're going to sign their contract. They're not going to sign yours. I can't resist this, but um, 
Couldn't you argue that the rampant copying and the lack of copying restrictions of Moai on Easter Island destroyed their entire civilization? Cop what, the uh, lack of, you think they should have patented the Moai? They, well, then they could have actually had them up for making too many of them. That would be, uh, yeah, that would be kind of interesting. Probably would have led to bloodshed earlier than, than in fact took place. They, they had a, a bloody war at the end of this whole thing, by the way. Uh, um, uh, the, the free trade agreement, the Australian free trade agreement, yep. all the negative effects of the, the copyright and things that was included in that, that seemed to kind of come out of nowhere. And then since, um, since that's been in effect, we haven't really heard much of the negative effects of that. And so is that, is that because of the reframing of the debate or? I assume so. I recall that shortly before that stuff was passed, there was a decision, I think it was about mod chips on the um, PlayStation. People may remember this one. There was an Australian Supreme Court decision that somebody who'd been modding these things was okay. He got off. And the head of Sony, I think it was the head of Sony, although I've, in my mind I'm hearing Steve Fulmer say this, so it could have been him, said, well, we're going to have to go for legal change on that. He was in Australia at the time. I thought that was a pretty, pretty sort of up-yourself thing to say about a sovereign country, but it actually turned out that way, so he obviously knew what he was talking about. Um, what can we do? I mean, as individuals, do you have any suggestions for to do items that we, uh, we can actually do to change these things? You need to lobby for um, actors to be made more public. I mean, the extent to which New Zealand has the ability to do that is, is, is frankly pretty limited, but certainly raise awareness about it. And to be a little bit fair to the MED officials who are negotiating it, they have actually tried to put up some information about it, and they, they do do briefings on it. They don't let media into the briefings, and they, uh, they're pretty careful about who they let in. But even so, um, you can, until then, all we can really do is wait until the thing comes out and see what is actually in it and what we're going to be expected to sign up to. And at that stage, um, at that stage, it'll be a matter of, um, of assessing what it's for. Incidentally, I, I would like to say that I'm not against trade agreements as such. What I think we do have the right to, though, is an open debate about what we give away in, and what we receive. So, we, yeah, it might be valid for us to give away something or other nationally that affects us all if nationally we're going to get something back. But if that's the case, can we at least have it out where we can see it and talk about it? Just, ra just raising the matter of the Copyright Act again. Uh, Copyright Act 1994, Section 131, criminal liability for making or dealing with infringing objects. Now, okay. I won't, now it's quite a mouthful to read out. You can all look at it on the www.legislation.gov.nz site, and within it, it carries a maximum up to five years jail. Sorry, the section number again, 19? Section 131 of the Copyright Act 1994. Thank Thanks. Yeah, I wish to comment on the same thing. I SMS to a lawyer friend, a mutual friend of ours, and she says that that clause deals only with commercial copyright infringement. So that's a crime. Non-commercial copyright infringement, I understand, is not a crime. Not New Zealand. Um, yes, that's probably how I got it into my head, but even so, that's fine, and thank you for that. Any more questions? Uh, one of the things that bothers me about when these things come in is that it goes from, for instance, um, when these copyright laws come in, they give exceptions, like to libraries and to non-commercial activity, yep. as opposed to being um, open by default. Um, so suddenly the, the people that are in a position to negotiate get an exception and continue to do what they can do, like libraries and students and whoever, um, but everybody else just ends up having to suffer the consequences. Yeah, we had the, uh, in the latest uh, copyright amendment bill, now Act, we had the interesting thing that you're allowed to, uh, th there was a whole business about protecting digital rights management, and the way the thing wound up was that um, libraries are allowed to break digital rights management on your behalf if, if it is being used to prevent fair dealing. 
which I thought was remarkable. And, and I know many, many very, very good librarians, but I'd be interested to know how many of them are capable of breaking DRM. <laughs> the, uh, the, other, um, the other issue in that area, of course, is access for the blind and for um, other people who require uh, specific software to access works. And there's, a, again, another treaty and another body being worked through on that one at the moment where uh, some, many people are arguing that there should be a generic exception in uh, copyright law to allow people who are blind to have um, screen reader access to things regardless of whether or not digital rights management would prevent that in the, in the normal course of things. That's been quite bitterly argued against by some countries. Um, you see one more question there? more of a comment with the blind and the DRM. I believe the situation in Australia is that the blind are allowed to break DRM, but nobody's allowed to help them and they're not allowed to help each other. <laughs> that may lead to a, a nation of blind Uber hackers, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Colin. I think there are those of us here who, um, who belong to countries where the governments are supposed to be open and consultative in the legislative process. Whoops. And yet we, have, um, we appear to have secret agreements um, being discussed in top secret, not really open and consultative. So I hope that you'll bring this matter back to your local ministers of parliaments or your local politicians and um, have a chat with them about it. So I'd like to thank Colin for bringing up um, awareness to these, these issues. And um, if you have any questions further on, he'll be around through to the end of the conference. And let's give him a hand of thanks. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Very kind. Yes,